Folks, I want to welcome you all to our first uh, Reese Brown bag for the uh, spring semester. Where it's, it's great to see such a great turnout. Uh, this is usually uh, my aunt and I have a few things to tell you about. Uh, we have a great semester uh, coming up before I introduce our speaker for the day. Um, we, uh, just in the immediate future, uh, I want to make sure that everybody realizes there's a, a slavery anti uh, trafficking conference that's going to be happening uh, starting on Thursday with an evening lecture uh, and then on Friday with a series of panel discussions uh, on this topic that's you know, really important for our area. Uh, and um, we're, we're taking a, a great interest in the conference, we're taking part in some of the panel discussions. Uh, looking forward to what this might uh, bring down the road for KU and for the uh, uh, research in this area. Uh, also on uh, Friday, uh, February 1st, we have the, uh, the FLAST deadline. Uh, if you're interested in the Four Language Area Studies Fellowship, uh, we have some information here. Uh, you can talk with me or you can talk with uh, Adrian about uh, what that is and how to apply. Uh, it's all online uh, at this point. Anything else we need to uh, say about that? I think you're all probably pretty familiar with that. Uh, that is also the deadline for uh, paper pro proposals for our April 10th uh, security conference that we do annually with Fort Leavenworth. Uh, this year's topic being Russia and China. Uh, and we've got several proposals, but uh, we'd like to see more. Uh, if you're interested in presenting on that topic, uh, send the proposals to our departmental area or just to me. Uh, and then uh, on Monday, upcoming Monday, we're starting a series of discussions on Kosovo. Uh, that's going to take place every Monday at noon uh, over the Kansas Union through February. We're starting out with uh, Ray Finch, who's going to give us sort of an overview, a background uh, to the conflict. Uh, and then from there, we're going to have several speakers uh, in Kosovo who are going to speak to us about the, the topic, uh, get several different uh, points of view. I've got posters uh, for that discussion series over here. If you want to grab one, post it, uh, share it with students, please. Uh, I also have a uh, events listings over here, and if you're not on our mailing list, um, I will have a, uh, a sign-up sheet uh, to make sure that you're getting uh, your weekly announcements of uh, things going on in the groups. Um, anything I missed? Is that, uh, for the immediate future, that's what we've got going on. Uh, our speaker today is Jared Warren, who is a second year uh, master's student at the Reese program. He is a graduate of Carleton College uh, in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Michigan, uh, where he uh, double majored in French and in uh, is it Slavic or history? History, sorry. Uh, and he's continued that uh, sort of research focus or research interest uh, in his career here at, at KU. Uh, the paper uh, that he's uh, about to uh, give a talk on uh, was based in part on a paper that he was asked to present in Brussels uh, in November uh, of, of uh, the last semester. And so uh, we're very happy to have him here. Talk about Adam Minskiewicz. Uh, turn it over to Jared from that. Thank you all for coming. Adam Mickiewicz, the Wielka Emigracja in Reason Romanticism. So the brief context, in 1830 is the November Uprising in Poland. The Russian partition of Poland is a fairly large revolution. And the Russians come in and call the rebellion. A significant number of the revolutionaries, the upper class artists, poets, they no longer feel welcome in Poland, there's a few repressions on the elite. They move primarily to Paris, where they, a lot of them remain for the next decade or two. Paris because it's, and this is known as the Vielka Emigrace, the Great Emigration. Paris is somewhat obviously the revolutionary center of Europe since the 1789 French Revolution. It's a, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in France, They're in all of Europe. They're all over Europe, people like Karl Marx, who was here on and off at this period, German poets that kind of, kind of, Frederick Chopin, Polish, but he's not there for political reasons. The center of utopian socialism, a lot of thinkers like Charles Fourier, the Comte de Saint-Simon, are creating their utopian tracks, <coughs> attempting to make these weird utopian communes and mostly failing. The side of French romanticism is Victor Hugo is writing his novels. Uh, Georges Saint, the novelist, creating all sorts of odd, fun, popular novels. 
the poet Gerard Nerval is parading around Paris with his lobster on a blue silk string because it knows the secrets of the deep and it doesn't bark. So it's within this circle of Bohemian Paris, it's a very dynamic place. The Poles initially go there in the hopes that the French government will officially politically support Poland. They'd hope that Poland, the France would intervene militarily on Poland's behalf. It doesn't. There's no reason they would. But so there's initially, though, in about 1830, 1831, a fairly substantial political interest in, Par on, the, in Paris on behalf of Poland. And I've, I've just put a few pictures of Paris from the period up just to sort of be a little more evocative. Uh, so this initial political interest is very short last, lasted. There were a few bills introduced to the Houses of Parliament, Congress, in Paris on behalf of Poland. There were a few bills trying to create monetary support for the Poles in Paris. And Miskiewicz actually does eventually get a small stipend, but not much to speak of. There are a large number of political societies founded not just in Paris, but especially a few in England. But this, after about 1831, this political interest dies out. The, however, there is, for a bit longer, a sort of popular interest, the Polish vogue, is somewhat orientalist. So this idea of revolutionary Poland is adopted. And there's scores of poets are writing poems about Poland and talking about how Poland is the avant-garde of Europe, thank you, and will bring European political liberalism. A few different plays are published and are wildly popular for a few months during the November Uprising. There's various journals, newspapers founded in support or capitalizing on this interest in Poland. Again, though, this dies down fairly quickly. And the only real lasting impact of the legacy of the, the November Uprising is in this small circle of Bohemian Paris, the artists, the poets, the playwrights, the musicians. These are the people who are absolutely fascinated by the Polish community in Paris and adopt a lot of the imagery, the motifs that these Polish individuals use and incorporate them in their own writings and political discourses. Before I talk much about Mitzkiewicz, just I have two graphs to give an indication, rough indication of the cosmopolitan nature of Paris, the number of foreigners in Paris. So these are just officially registered individuals in Paris, taken from I think the police bulletins. It's in a book by Lloyd Kramer, Threshold of a New World, which is a sort of surface introduction study of the experience of exile in Paris during the July monarchy. In 1837 is about 47,000 officially registered foreigners, about 20,000 transient foreigners who are there passing through there for a few months, visiting the salons or what have you. By the end of about two decades, it's increased. It's almost 200,000 officially registered foreigners. This graph breaks it down a bit more in ethnic linguistic groups. The Poles appear in 1831 are extremely small, only 156 officially registered undoubtedly quite a few more. Then by 1832, it's rapidly increasing, 2,000. And then by the end of the July monarchy, it's 4,000 officially registered. There are substantially more. There, I think the Gelgami Graz is traditionally calculated to be about 10,000 people. I don't know where those numbers come from, but somewhere 5, 4,000 political emigres are in Paris. Adam Mitzkevich, the Polish romantic poet first comes to Paris in the aftermath of the November Uprising. He did not partake in the revolution himself. He was in Italy, I believe, in Rome at the time. After initial hesitation, he slowly made his way back to Poland to try to join the military uprising, but perhaps on purpose didn't quite make it back in time <laughs> and joins the immigration in Germany with the number of the exiles as they're making their way across Europe to Paris. By the time he gets to Paris, he's really at the end of his career as a poet. His last major poem 
Pantade, which was published in Paris in 1834. And at this point, he really stops most of his poetic activity and instead tries to advocate politically in behalf of Poland and Paris to very little success. His, the major work that he publishes in Paris for, in this dialogue with, with the French, Polish, Bohemian community, is his books of the Polish nation, the Polish pilgrimage, published in 1832. It's, I hope we've all been exposed to it. It's where he first uh, interprets the Polish, the partitions of Poland, the death of death of Poland in crystal, Christological messianistic imagery, how Poland was crucified by the satanic trinity, and how on the third day Poland would rise to save the peoples of Europe from their sins. The Pope didn't like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, this book is what inspires a lot of Mickiewicz, which is, or, this is what makes Mickiewicz popular in the Bohemian Paris. They're absolutely fascinated by this book, and to a large extent they buy into this imagery. So, the, the, it's a lot of, a number of Polish writers, political figures, poets, adopt and change a lot of the imagery in the books of the Polish nation, the Polish pilgrimage for their own purposes, and generally take a more universal scope. Instead of focusing so directly on the role of Poland, they like to focus more exclusively sort of on the role of exile, the role of suffering as means to restore Europe to some medieval spiritual state of grandeur. I don't know quite what they were thinking. But this man, the Prince de Lamennais, who's a renegade French priest, he was born in the 1890s in Brittany, initially as an ultramontanist, absolute supporter of the complete authority of the Pope over the Catholic Church, has a lot of other sort of slightly more heretical in the eyes of the Pope's ideas. The Pope eventually condemns a lot of his writings, and he becomes much more of a social democrat and moves away from the official church. He's deeply inspired by Mitzkevich's books and writes his own version of them, the Catholic and Choyon, the words of a believer, a believer's words, in which he, he takes this idea of exile and talks about <coughs> how just because someone's in exile and suffering doesn't mean they've done anything wrong, but they might be suffering on behalf of Europe and they eventually they will sort of redeem Europe through their own suffering. And he, throughout the book, he doesn't reference Poland very explicitly. He did write various poetry about Poland, but he, there is a lot of imagery directly taken from Mickiewicz's books and sort of subtle, disguised, indirect references to Poland. Because of this initial interest in Mickiewicz, he and Mickiewicz do become fast friends. They corresponded a lot. And instead of consoling Mickiewicz about his suffering in Paris, he writes this letter to Mickiewicz in which he calls him my soul. Okay. <laughs> my soul, pursuing you, yourself, pursuing you shall have nothing more than God. Then you will go off and leave you alone. You have loved truth and justice. You wanted that, nothing but that, but for their part. But they being Mickiewicz's detractors, his critics. They love the opinion that floats and passes. They wish for a soft bedside where they can lay their head. My soul, strengthen yourself, for you have more to endure. At the back of the chalice, there still remain several mouthfuls of the dregs which you must drink. What I want to highlight here is this word chalice. I think Lamine is directly taking up a lot of the Eucharistic imagery in Mickiewicz's books and sort of apply Christological significance to Mickiewicz himself. So Mickiewicz is this Christ figure who will redeem Europe through his suffering. As Lamine becomes more secular, Mickiewicz becomes increasingly mystical. The, the two sort of part ways and don't stop talking to each other after a few initial decades. But I, I should point out too, Mickiewicz actually ascribes a lot of influence and interest in Lamine's early religious writings to his writing of the books of the Polish nation, the Polish pilgrimage. And then so he writes his version, and then Lamine is in turn inspired by that and writes. So it's, it's, there's a bit of a dialogue happening between them in the early 1830s. In the late 1830s, Mickiewicz moves to Lausanne, Switzerland, where he'd been offered a position teaching Latin literature, classics, at 
the university there, he's really much more personally stable and financially stable than he's probably been at any point in his life. He doesn't really like being away from the cosmopolitan Paris. So when he, he's offered a position teaching at the Collège de France, teaching Slavic literature, he immediately accepts. His friends had created this new chair in Slavic literature. So he comes back to Paris and is once again thrown back into semi-poverty. But this is where he finally gains a real public profile, an important position in Parisian society where he can propagate a lot of his wacky ideas with an adoring audience at the beginning. So these series of lectures are known as the Kuch de Slavic Lectures. And throughout the course of these lectures, Mitzkevich returns again and again and again to this concept of language, of speech, and the word. It isn't that surprising for a poet, but he sort of sets up this interesting dichotomy between France and Poland, and relationship which hinges on really himself as a speaker, as a poet, his words, his, what brings Poland into the French profile, and is in turn, he's the one telling the French what Poland will do to save them. This, this concept of speech, the perchol is the word in French he uses repeatedly. This is it's picked up by a lot of his uh, French reviewers and subsequent subsequent poets, poets, lecturers, artists. This is this is the concept they're very interested in. And Mitskevich, in one of his lectures, writes that speech or says that speech is the flesh and spirit held together by by the divine spark which resides in man. So speech for Mitskevich is has religious power. It's sort of the divine center of what it means to be human. It's what melds this abstract spiritual half of the human with this physical body. And the French go absolutely gaga <laughs> over this. And especially the they think that Mitzkevich is a very good representation of what of this sort of mystical divine speech. <coughs> Mitzkevich initially, at the beginning, the very first lecture, he writes, he calls Paris the capital of speech. He writes, I was called to speak in the name of the people with whom my nation is intimately linked by its past and future. I was called to speak in a time when speech is a very great power in a city, if I'm permitted to say it, which is the capital of speech. So he's sort of initially flattering the French, saying, this is, this is the city where speech, this divine thing, happens par excellence. And he tells his audience to it several years later that the average French man, the average French woman, sort of senses this, the value of living speech and somehow achieves this extra eloquence that other linguistic groups don't achieve. But at the same time, he sort of backtracks and tries to argue that the Slavs, especially the Poles, have this same sort of understanding of speech, and they're the ones now who the French need to sh shut up and listen to. <laughs> All peoples have uttered the last word now, Slavs, it is our turn to speak. So this is what he at the Collège de France to do. He's there to tell them that France is going to save the peoples of Europe from their sins. <laughs> so he roots the idea of the Poles, the Slavs as a people of speech in the etymology of the word, I think it's debated a little bit now, but the, the etymology of the word Slav, Slovo word in Polish, Slav means the people of speech, or, it's, or more accurately of the word, translated sort of as a verb or a word. Verb is important. It's action. It's something that's happening. And according to these cases, the Slavs managed to preserve the pure tradition of speech. This, I guess, the divine spark better than any other people. So as Western Europe sees on this religious decline, Poland is there to restore uh, this religiosity of Europe. And at, but then, just several pages later after some of this discussion, he writes that, or he tells his audience that, quote, in order to prove that they have the right to belong in the Christian community, the Slavs for some time have tried to acquire speech, to speak your language, to push their works into the same trends as your literature. So although the Slavs have this 
inherently well-cultivated and guarded tradition of speech, they have to learn French in order to be civilized. So. It, it's this, these ideas of speech and literature and the religious nature of speech and language that the French are most interested in. They, they don't really care about his political ideas, but they like the fact that, hey, I'm a writer, and I have religious sort of prophetic significance. Cool. So, oh, this is a daguerreotype sketch of Mies Cavish giving his lectures at the Collège de France, which captures the spirit, I think, of what was happening there fairly well. <laughs> By the end of the three years of lecture, I think it was a bit chaotic. Another picture of Paris. This woman, Georges Sand, who we probably know primarily as for her about decade long liaison with Frédéric Chopin, was a very strong supporter of Mitskevich's. They'd become friends, and she organized several events, concerts, and she forced Chopin to play. And take time to, uh, on behalf of Poland and on behalf of Mickiewicz to raise money for the Polish emigres. She's really a fairly secular figure within the Parisian Bohemian community, but what interests her most about Mickiewicz is this perceived religiosity, his, his spirituality. And um, in 1839, she writes a, uh, an essay essay on fantastical drama, in which she compares Byron Goethe and Mickiewicz. And in this essay, at the very beginning, she sets up a hierarchy of different types of poet. At the very top is this poet who manages to achieve this religious, divine experience and significance. And more than Byron or Goethe, she thinks that Mickiewicz has accomplished this. And she writes that, quote, Mickiewicz's language is Catholic and that this Catholicism is a more audacious and advanced philosophy than the legendary Catholicism of Faust. I'm not sure what she's referring to, but the Catholicism of Faust. But it's not, she's, Mitzkevich is Catholic, yes, but what interests her is that it, this Catholicism is audacious. It's not, it, it provides the Bohemian community of Paris a way to sort of be religious without being orthodox. Like Lamennais had capitalized on sort of the idea of an exile and that sort of purification that exile brings, Sand also draws this theme out and writes that in the same essay that exile had purified and strengthened Mitskevich's re religiosity so much that he achieved the sublime fury of genius. And she writes too that Mitskevich is the only great ecstatic I know. He is touched by that grand intellectual disease that makes him akin to the famous ascetics, to Socrates, to Jesus, to St. John, Dante, and Joan of Arc. And again, this Christological comparisons. It's an odd list. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't as interested in being robust, theological, and they don't explain all of their claims, which make it more fun, I think, too. In writing this very favorable review of Mickiewicz's poetry, Georges George Sand writes that I picture myself as accomplishing a religious duty toward Mickiewicz in interceding with his critics and telling them they can't judge him by normal standards because he's this, this top tier of poets. So regular types of literary criticism and interpretation don't even apply to him. So but what is important is that <laughs> Mies Kavich has this religious figure is eliciting religious obediences from even secular figures like Georges Sand. So, uh, to go back and sort of conclude a little bit, with, and to draw some of these disparate themes of religiosity of speech and speech and poetry and these political ideas, I'd like to talk for a moment about uh, Mies Kavich's and Mies Kavich and his improvisations. He was extremely well known. He would travel around for most of his life. He would get up in various gatherings and improvise apparently brilliant poetry and send his audience into hysterics. He'd done this since 
his days as a member of the Philomath Club in Lithuania, in Polish, when he was sent into internal exile in, in Paris, or sorry, in Russia, he switches to French so he can be understood. And he continues this in Paris to great acclaim, and a number of French historians, poets, tried to do it, tried to create, recreate these improvisations themselves, but really just failed completely. So I've, I have here a somewhat long anecdote from Georges Sand's autobiography published in the 1860s, but it's, it describes the sort of situation of one of these improvisations very well. So, in those days, a rather strange event happened. In a gathering of Polish emigres, a certain, one might say, rather mediocre poet, and somewhat jealous, recited a piece of verse addressed to Mickiewicz, in which, in the middle of his lavish praises, he complained with sincere resentment, although not in bad taste, of the superiority of this great poet. It was, as we understood, both a reproach and a tribute at the same time. But the somber Mickiewicz, as insensible to one feeling as to the other, rose and improvised a poem in response, or rather, a discourse with prodigious effect. No one could say exactly what happened. Everyone who was there left with a different memory. Some said he spoke for five minutes, others for an hour. It is certain that he spoke so well and said, so, and said such beautiful things that they all fell into a sort of delirium. One could hear only screams and tears. Several had nervous breakdowns, and others could not sleep at night. <laughs> the Count, Papier, on returning home, was in such a strange state of exultation that his wife thought him mad and was extremely terrified. But as he recounted to her as best he could, excluding Mickiewicz's improvisation, no one could repeat a single word of it, but only the effect of Mickiewicz's speech in his audience, the Countess Plater fell into the same estate as her husband and began to cry, to pray, and to ramble deliriously. Those there were all convinced that there was something superhuman in this great man, that he was inspired like the prophets, and their superstition was so great that one of these mornings they could well have made him a god. And then, as she concludes, she writes that between the between reason and madness is a spiritual state which has never been well observed or quantified, and which religious faiths of all times and all peoples have assumed man to be in direct contact with the spirit of God. So, we get the picture. <laughs> so, over and over again, it's Mitzkevich presenting himself sort of as a prophet, someone someone who actually can elicit these religious obediences from his audience. This is, these are the ideas, this power of speech, this is what the French propagate in their own works, it's what Lamennais writes about in his books, it's what a number of poets try to write about in their poetry. I, I don't have time to get into all of that, but I think we can draw a few more general conclusions about this religious discourse of speech for the importance of the Vyadki and Grazia within Paris as a whole. So, while Mickiewicz may have been only the most prominent Polish exile in Paris, many of the other Polish emig immigrants were also writers, and words thus shaped the relationship not merely between Mickiewicz and the French, but also between the French and the Poles at large. Through the efforts of Mickiewicz and his followers, Poles and Parisians created a romantic discourse on Poland which functioned primarily via a religious vocabulary. But this discourse never remained much more than a carefully crafted set of words. Words, written or spoken, were the essence of this relationship between France and Poland. The most influential Polish individuals in Paris were wordsmiths, as were the Parisians who received these Polish ideals. <coughs> ideas. Anna Mickiewicz, not to mention Lubiusz Słowacki, Cyprian Norwid, Zygmunt Kraszynski, a number of Polish romantic poets, and the Polish bookseller Aleksander Jadowowicki, each of these based his artistic and political significance in Paris off of his written work. So these poles gained prominence thanks to their poetry, to their novels, to their plays, to the university lectures, to their, the, what they published, to their words. The French as well recognized the importance of the word in this relationship between France and Poland, or at least the French who deigned to recognize the existence of poles in Paris <coughs> were frequently authors or journalists themselves and used their pre-existing talents to engage the Polish cause. In Paris, it was these poets, players, authors who believed that Polish romantic thought, political, religious, artistic, could and would make a contribution to European humanity, or save Europe from their sins. These poets used rhyme, cadence, and meter to engage the Polish cause, and banking on the social power of the written word and essays, 
groups of radical Parisians founded a journal Le Polonais to defend Polish and European political liberalism. Playwrights took up their pens to craft plays in support of Poland's November uprising, capturing the power of the word both written via the play's text and spoken via the play's performance. The Marquis de Lafayette gave speeches in the National Assembly on behalf of Poland. Edgar Kine asked, who has heard speech? Again, it's the same word. More sincere and more religious, more Christian, more extraordinary than that of this exile. Again, exile. In the middle of his peoples, that of Mitzkevich, a prophet under the willows. And Felicite de Domine, inspired by Mitzkevich's Ksiengi Narodu Polskiego Pielgrzeństwo Polskiego, wrote his book, the book Pechol den Koyon. The fate of Poland was discussed in parliaments and streets, on sidewalks and cafes, in essays and newspapers. But this web of Parisian interlocutors rarely stopped talking to take concrete political action. French artists and Polish artists were mostly satisfied with the effect of the written or spoken word. They found the activity of writing and speaking to be more comfortable or more possible than direct political action. The familiarity then of this discourse of the ecstatic religious word created a mutually comprehensible community between Polish and French artists. However, through such an obsession with the word itself, Poland, the territory, was reduced to a simple rhetorical device. Poland was no longer a cause but an image, a series of words, the Polish question. Thank you. We take a few more questions, Jared. More than happy to answer any questions, comments.